Section 40 of A Half Century of Conflict. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Half Century of Conflict by Francis Parkman. Chapter 22, Part 1, 1745 to 1747. Acadian Conflicts. Since the capture of Louisbourg, France had held constantly in view, as an object of prime importance, the recovery of her lost colony of Acadia. This was one of the chief aims of Donville's expedition, and that of La Jonquière in the next year, and to make assurance still more sure, a large body of Canadians under Monsieur de Ramsay had been sent to Acadia to cooperate with Donville's force, but the greater part of them had been recalled to aid in defending Quebec against the expected attack of the English. They returned when the news came that Donville was at Chibucto, and Ramsay, with a part of his command, advanced upon Port Royal or Annapolis, in order to support the fleet in its promised attack on that place. He encamped at a little distance from the English fort, till he heard of the disasters that had ruined the fleet, and then fell back to Chignecto, on the neck of the Acadian peninsula, where he made his quarters with a force which, including Micmac, Maliseet, and Penobscot Indians, amounted at one time to about 1,600 men. If France was bent on recovering Acadia, Shirley was no less resolved to keep it, if he could. In his belief it was the key of the British American colonies, and again and again he urged the Duke of Newcastle to protect it. But Newcastle seems scarcely to have known where Acadia was, being ignorant of most things except the art of managing the House of Commons, and careless of all things that could not help his party and himself. Hence Shirley's hyperboles, though never without a basis of truth, were lost upon him. Once, it is true, he sent three hundred men to Annapolis, but one hundred and eighty of them died on the voyage, or lay helpless in Boston hospitals, and the rest could better have been spared, some being recruits from English jails, and others Irish Catholics, several of whom deserted to the French, with information of the state of the garrison. The defence of Acadia was left to Shirley and his assembly, who in time of need sent companies of militia and rangers to Annapolis, and thus on several occasions saved it from returning to France. Shirley was the most watchful and strenuous defender of British interests on the continent, and in the present crisis British and colonial interests were one. He held that if Acadia were lost, the peace and safety of all the other colonies would be in peril, and in spite of the immense efforts made by the French court to recover it, he felt that the chief danger of the province was not from without, but from within. If a thousand French troops should land in Nova Scotia, he writes to Newcastle, all the people would rise to join them, besides all the Indians. So too thought the French officials in America. The governor and intendant of Canada wrote to the colonial minister, the inhabitants, with few exceptions, wish to return under the French dominion, and will not hesitate to take up arms as soon as they see themselves free to do so. That is, as soon as we become masters of Port Royal, or they have powder and other munitions of war, and are backed by troops for their protection against the resentment of the English. Up to this time, however, though they had aided Duvivier in his attack on Annapolis so far as was possible without seeming to do so, they had not openly taken arms, and their refusal to fight for the besiegers is one among several causes to which Mascarene ascribes the success of his defence. 
while the greater part remained attached to France. Some leaned to the English, who bought their produce and paid them in ready coin. Money was rare with the Acadians, who loved it, and were so addicted to hoarding it that the French authorities were led to speculate as to what might be the object of these careful savings. Though the Acadians loved France, they were not always ready to sacrifice their interests to her. They would not supply Ramsay's force with provisions in exchange for his promissory notes, but demanded hard cash. This he had not to give, and was near being compelled to abandon his position in consequence. At the same time, in consideration of specie payment, the inhabitants brought in fuel for the English garrison at Louisbourg, and worked at repairing the rotten chevaux de frise of Annapolis. Mascarene, commandant at that place, being of French descent, was disposed at first to sympathize with the Acadians and treat them with a lenity that to the members of his council seemed neither fitting nor prudent. He wrote to Shirley, The French inhabitants are certainly in a very perilous situation. Those who pretend to be their friends and old masters, having let loose a parcel of banditti to plunder them, whilst, on the other hand, they see themselves threatened with ruin if they fail in their allegiance to the British government. This unhappy people were, in fact, between two fires. France claimed them on one side, and England on the other, and each demanded their adhesion without regard to their feelings or their welfare. The banditti of whom Mascarene speaks were the Micmac Indians, who were completely under the control of their missionary Le Loutre, and were used by him to terrify the inhabitants into renouncing their English allegiance and actively supporting the French cause. By the Treaty of Utrecht, France had transferred Acadia to Britain, and the inhabitants had afterwards taken an oath of fidelity to King George. Thus they were British subjects, but as their oath had been accompanied by a promise, or at least a clear understanding, that they should not be required to take arms against Frenchmen or Indians, they had become known as the Neutral French. This name tended to perplex them, and in their ignorance and simplicity they hardly knew to which side they owed allegiance. Their illiteracy was extreme, Few of them could sign their names, and a contemporary well acquainted with them declares that he knew but a single Acadian who could read and write. This was probably the notary Leblanc, whose compositions are crude and illiterate. Ignorant of books and isolated in a wild and remote corner of the world, the Acadians knew nothing of affairs and were totally incompetent to meet the crisis that was soon to come upon them. In activity and enterprise they were far behind the Canadians, who looked on them as inferiors. Their pleasures were those of the humblest and simplest peasants. They were contented with their lot, and asked only to be let alone. Their intercourse was unceremonious to such a point that they never addressed each other, or, it is said, even strangers as monsieur. They had the social equality which can exist only in the humblest conditions of society, and presented the phenomenon of a primitive little democracy hatched under the wing of an absolute monarchy. Each was as good as his neighbor. They had no natural leaders, nor any to advise or guide them, except the missionary priest, who in every case was expected by his superiors to influence them in the interest of France, and who in fact constantly did so. While one observer represents them as living in a state of primeval innocence, another describes both men and women as extremely foul of speech, from which he draws inferences unfavorable to their domestic morals, which nevertheless were commendable, as is usual with a well-fed and unambitious peasantry, 
they were very prolific and are said to have doubled their number every sixteen years in seventeen forty eight they counted in the peninsula of nova scotia between twelve and thirteen thousand souls the english rule had been of the lightest so light that it could scarcely be felt and this was not surprising since the only instruments for enforcing it over a population wholly french were some two hundred disorderly soldiers in the crumbling little fort of annapolis and the province was left perforce to take care of itself the appearance of donville's fleet caused great excitement among the acadians who thought they were about to pass again under the crown of france fifty of them went on board the french ships at chibucto to pilot them to the attack of annapolis and to their dismay found that no attack was to be made when ramsay with his canadians and indians took post at chignecto and built a fort at baie verte on the neck of the peninsula of nova scotia the english power in that part of the colony seemed at an end the inhabitants cut off all communications with annapolis and detained the officers whom mascarene sent for intelligence from the first outbreak of the war it was evident that the french built their hopes of recovering acadia largely on a rising of the acadians against the english rule and that they spared no efforts to excite such a rising early in seventeen forty five a violent and cruel precaution against this danger was suggested william sheriff provincial secretary gave it as his opinion that the acadians ought to be removed being a standing menace to the colony this is the first proposal of such a nature that i find some months later shirley writes that on a false report of the capture of annapolis by the french the acadians sang te deum and that every sign indicates that there will be an attempt in the spring to capture annapolis with their help again shirley informs newcastle that the french will get possession of acadia unless the most dangerous of the inhabitants are removed and english settlers put in their place he adds that there are not two hundred and twenty soldiers at annapolis to defend the province against the whole body of acadians and indians and he tells the minister that unless the expedition against canada should end in the conquest of that country the removal of some of the acadians will be a necessity he means those of chignecto who were kept in a threatening attitude by the presence of ramsay and his canadians and who as he thinks had forfeited their lands by treasonable conduct shirley believes that families from new england might be induced to take their place and that these if settled under suitable regulations would form a military frontier to the province of nova scotia strong enough to keep the canadians out and hold the acadians to their allegiance the duke of bedford thinks the plan a good one but objects to the expense commodore knowles then governor of louisbourg who being threatened with consumption and convinced that the climate was killing him vented his feelings in strictures against everything and everybody was of opinion that the acadians having broken their neutrality ought to be expelled at once and expresses the amiable hope that should his majesty adopt this plan he will charge him with executing it shirley's energetic nature inclined him to trenchant measures and he had nothing of modern humanitarianism but he was not inhuman and he shrank from the cruelty of forcing whole communities into exile while knowles and others called for wholesale expatriation he still held that it was possible to turn the greater part of the Acadians into safe subjects of the British crown, and to this end he advised the planting of a fortified town where Halifax now stands, and securing by forts and garrisons the neck of the Acadian peninsula, where the population was most numerous and most disaffected. The garrisons, he thought, 
would not only impose respect, but would furnish the Acadians with what they wanted most, ready markets for their produce, and thus bind them to the British by strong ties of interest. Newcastle thought the plan good, but wrote that its execution must be deferred to a future day. Three years later it was partly carried into effect by the foundation of Halifax, but at that time the disaffection of the Acadians had so increased, and the hope of regaining the province for France had risen so high, that this partial and tardy assertion of British authority only spurred the French agents to redoubled efforts to draw the inhabitants from the allegiance they had sworn to the crown of England. Shirley had also other plans in view for turning the Acadians into good British subjects. He proposed as a measure of prime necessity to exclude French priests from the province. The free exercise of their religion had been ensured to the inhabitants by the Treaty of Utrecht, and on this point the English authorities had given no just cause of complaint. A priest had occasionally been warned, suspended, or removed, but without a single exception, so far as appears, this was in consequence of conduct which tended to excite disaffection, and would have incurred equal or greater penalties in the case of a layman. The sentence was directed not against the priest, but against the political agitator. Shirley's plan of excluding French priests from the province would not have violated the provisions of the treaty, provided that the inhabitants were supplied with other priests, not French subjects, and therefore not politically dangerous. But though such a measure was several times proposed by the provincial authorities, the exasperating apathy of the Newcastle government gave no hope that it could be accomplished. The influences most dangerous to British rule did not proceed from love of France or sympathy of race, but from the power of religion over a simple and ignorant people, trained in profound love and awe of their church and its ministers, who were used by the representatives of Louis the Fifteenth as agents to alienate the Acadians from England. The most strenuous of these clerical agitators was Abbe Le Loutre, missionary to the Micmacs, and after 1753, vicar general of Acadia. He was a fiery and enterprising zealot, inclined by temperament to methods of violence, detesting the English and restrained neither by pity nor scruple from using threats of damnation and the Micmac tomahawk to frighten the Acadians into doing his bidding. The worst charge against him, that of exciting the Indians of his mission to murder Captain Howe, an English officer, has not been proved, but it would not have been brought against him by his own countrymen if his character and past conduct had gained him their esteem. The other Acadian priests were far from sharing Le Loutre's violence, but their influence was always directed to alienating the inhabitants from their allegiance to King George. Hence, Shirley regarded the conversion of the Acadians to Protestantism as a political measure of the first importance, and proposed the establishment of schools in the province to that end. Thus far, his recommendations are perfectly legitimate, but when he adds that rewards ought to be given to Acadians who renounce their faith, few will venture to defend him. Newcastle would trouble himself with none of his schemes, and Acadia was left to drift with the tide. As before, I shall finish my troubling your grace on the matters of Nova Scotia with this letter, writes the persevering Shirley, and he proceeds to ask, as a proper scheme for better securing the subjection of the French inhabitants and Indians there, that the governor and council at Annapolis have special authority and direction from the king to arrest and examine such Acadians as shall be most obnoxious 
and dangerous to his majesty's government and if found guilty of treasonable correspondence with the enemy to dispose of them and their estates in such manner as his majesty shall order at the same time promising indemnity to the rest for past offences upon their taking or renewing the oath of allegiance end of section forty section forty one of a half century of conflict this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a half century of conflict by francis parkman chapter twenty two part two to this it does not appear that newcastle made any answer except to direct shirley eight or nine months later to tell the acadians that so long as they were peaceable subjects they should be protected in property and religion thus left to struggle unaided with a most difficult problem entirely outside of his functions as governor of massachusetts shirley did what he could the most pressing danger as he thought rose from the presence of ramsay and his canadians at chignecto for that officer spared no pains to induce the acadians to join him in another attempt against annapolis telling them that if they did not drive out the english the english would drive them out he was now at mines trying to raise the inhabitants in arms for france shirley thought it necessary to counteract him and force him and his Canadians back to the Isthmus, whence they had come. But as the ministry would give no soldiers, he was compelled to draw them from New England. The defense of Acadia was the business of the home government, and not of the colonies, but as they were deeply interested in the preservation of the endangered province, Massachusetts gave five hundred men in response to Shirley's call, and Rhode Island and New Hampshire added between them as many more. Less than half of these levies reached Acadia. It was the stormy season. The Rhode Island vessels were wrecked near Martha's Vineyard. A New Hampshire transport sloop was intercepted by a French armed vessel and ran back to Portsmouth. 470 men from Massachusetts under Colonel Arthur Noble were all who reached Annapolis, whence they sailed for mines, accompanied by a few soldiers of the garrison. Storms, drifting ice, and the furious tides of the Bay of Fundy made their progress so difficult and uncertain that Noble resolved to finish the journey by land and on the 4th of December he disembarked near the place now called French Cross, at the foot of the North Mountain, a lofty barrier of rock and forest extending along the southern shore of the Bay of Fundy. Without a path and without guides, the party climbed the snow-encumbered heights and toiled towards their destination, each man carrying provisions for fourteen days in his haversack. After sleeping eight nights without shelter among the snowdrifts, they reached the Acadian village of Grand Pré, the chief settlement of the district of Mines. Ramsay and his Canadians were gone. On learning the approach of an English force, he had tried to persuade the Acadians that they were to be driven from their homes and that their only hope was in joining him to meet force by force. But they trusted Shirley's recent assurance of protection, and replied that they would not break their oath of fidelity to King George. On this, Ramsay retreated to his old station at Chignecto, and Noble and his men occupied Grand Pré without opposition. The village consisted of small, low, wooden houses, scattered at intervals for the distance of a mile and a half, and therefore ill-fitted for defence. 
The English had the frame of a blockhouse, or, as some say, of two blockhouses, ready to be set up on their arrival. But as the ground was hard frozen, it was difficult to make a foundation, and the frames were therefore stored in outbuildings of the village, with the intention of raising them in the spring. The vessels which had brought them, together with stores, ammunition, five small cannon, and a good supply of snowshoes, had just arrived at the landing place, and here, with incredible fatuity, were allowed to remain, with most of their indispensable contents still on board. The men, meanwhile, were quartered in the Acadian houses. Noble's position was critical, but he was assured that he could not be reached from Chignecto in such a bitter season, and this he was too ready to believe, though he himself had just made a march, which, if not so long, was quite as arduous. Yet he did not neglect every precaution, but kept out scouting parties to range the surrounding country, while the rest of his men took their ease in the Acadian houses, living on the provisions of the villagers, for which payment was afterwards made. Some of the inhabitants who had openly favoured Ramsay and his followers fled to the woods in fear of the consequences, but the greater part remained quietly in the village. At the head of the Bay of Fundy its waters form a fork, consisting of Chignecto Bay on the one hand and Mines Basin on the other. At the head of Chignecto Bay was the Acadian settlement of Chignecto, or Beaubassin, in the houses of which Ramsay had quartered his Canadians. Here the neck of the Acadian peninsula is at its narrowest. The distance across to Bay Verte, where Ramsay had built a fort, being little more than twelve miles. Thus he controlled the isthmus, from which, however, Noble hoped to dislodge him in the spring. In the afternoon of the 8th of January, an Acadian who had been sent to mines by the missionary Germain came to Beaubassin with the news that 220 English were at Grand Pré, and that many more were expected. Ramsay instantly formed a plan of extraordinary hardihood, and resolved by a rapid march and a night attack to surprise the newcomers. His party was greatly reduced by disease, and in order to recruit it he wrote to La Corne, Recollet missionary at Miramichi, to join him with his Indians, writing at the same time to Maillard, former colleague of Le Loutre at the mission of Shubenacadie, and to Girard, priest of Cobequid, to muster Indians, collect provisions, and gather information concerning the English. Meanwhile his Canadians busied themselves with making snowshoes and dog sledges for the march. Ramsay could not command the expedition in person, as an accident to one of his knees had disabled him from marching. This was less to be regretted in view of the quality of his officers, for he had with him the flower of the warlike Canadian noblesse. Coulon de Villiers, who seven years later defeated Washington at Fort Necessity, Beaujou, the future hero of the Monongahela, in appearance a carpet knight, in reality a bold and determined warrior, the Chevalier de la Corne, a model of bodily and mental hardihood, Saint-Pierre, La Naudière, saint Urs, Delinieris, Cortemanche, Repitegny, Beauchebert, Gasp, Colombier, Marine, Lusignan, all adepts in the warfare of surprise and sudden onslaught in which the Canadians excelled. Coulon de Villiers commanded in Ramsay's place, and on the 21st of January he and other officers led their men across the isthmus from Beaubassin to Bay Verte. Chapter 5
where they all encamped in the woods, and where they were joined by a party of Indians and some Acadians from Beaubassin and Isle St. Jean. Provisions, ammunition, and other requisites were distributed, and at noon on the 23rd they broke up their camp, marched three leagues, and bivouacked towards evening. On the next morning they marched again at daybreak. There was a sharp cold with a storm of snow, not the large, moist, lazy flakes that fall peacefully and harmlessly, but those small crystalline particles that drive spitefully before the wind and prick the cheek like needles. It was the kind of snowstorm called in Canada La Poudrerie. They had hoped to make a long day's march, but feet and faces were freezing, and they were forced to stop at noon under such shelter as the thick woods of pine, spruce, and fir could supply. In the morning they marched again, following the border of the sea, their dog teams dragging provisions and baggage over the broken ice of creeks and inlets, which they sometimes avoided by hewing paths through the forest. After a day of extreme fatigue, they stopped at the small bay where the town of Wallace now stands. Beaujeu says, while we were digging out the snow to make our huts, there came two Acadians with letters from Monsieur Maillard and Girard. The two priests sent a mixture of good and evil news. On one hand, the English were more numerous than had been reported, on the other, they had not set up the blockhouses they had brought with them. Some Acadians of the neighboring settlement joined the party at this camp, as also did a few Indians. On the next morning, January the 27th, the adventurers stopped at the village of Tatmagouche, where they were again joined by a number of Acadians. After mending their broken sledges, they resumed their march, and at five in the afternoon reached a place called Bacuel, at the beginning of the portage that led some twenty-five miles across the country to Cobequid, now Truro, at the head of Mines Basin. Here they were met by Girard, priest of Cobequid, from whom Coulon exacted a promise to meet him again at that village in two days. Girard gave the promise unwillingly, fearing, says Beaujou, to embroil himself with the English authorities. He reported that the force at Grand Pré counted at least 450, or, as some said, more than 500. This startling news ran through the camp, but the men were not daunted. The more there are, they said, the more we shall kill. The party spent the 28th in mending their damaged sledges, and in the afternoon they were joined by more Acadians and Indians. Thus reinforced, they marched again, and towards evening reached a village on the outskirts of Cobequid. Here the missionary Maillard joined them, to the great satisfaction of Coulon, who relied on him and his brother priest Girard to procure supplies of provisions. Maillard promised to go himself to Grand Pré with the Indians of his mission. The party rested for a day and set out again on the 1st of February, stopped at Maillard's house in Cobequid for the provisions he had collected for them, and then pushed on towards the river Shubenacadi, which runs from the south into Cobequid Bay, the head of Mines Basin. When they reached the river, they found it impassable from floating ice, which forced them to seek a passage at some distance above. Coulon was resolved, however, that at any risk a detachment should cross at once to stop the roads to Grand Pré and to prevent the English from being warned of his approach. For though the Acadians inclined to the French, and were eager to serve them when the risk was not too great, there were some of them who, from interest or fear, were ready to make favor with the English by carrying them intelligence. 
Oshebert, with ten Canadians, put out from shore in a canoe, and were near perishing among the drifting ice, but they gained the farther shore at last, and guarded every path to Grand Pré. The main body filed on snowshoes up the east bank of the Shuba Canadi, where the forests were choked with snow and encumbered with fallen trees, over which the sledges were to be dragged to their great detriment. On this day, the third, they made five leagues, on the next only two, which brought them within half a league of Le Loutre's Micmac mission. Not far from this place the river was easily passable on the ice, and they continued their march westward across the country to the river Kanetcook, by ways so difficult that their Indian guide lost the path, and for a time led them astray. On the 7th, Borchebert and his party rejoined them, and brought a reinforcement of sixteen Indians, whom the Acadians had furnished with arms. Provisions were failing till on the 8th, as they approached the village of Pisiquid, now Windsor, the Acadians, with great zeal, brought them a supply. They told them, too, that the English at Grand Pré were perfectly secure, suspecting no danger. On the ninth, in spite of a cold, dry storm of snow, they reached the west branch of the river Avon. It was but seven French leagues to Grand Pré, which they hoped to reach before night, but fatigue compelled them to rest till the tenth. At noon of that day, the storm still continuing, they marched again, though they could hardly see their way for the driving snow. They soon came to a small stream, along the frozen surface of which they drew up in order, and by command of Coulon, Beaujou divided them into ten parties, for simultaneous attacks on as many houses occupied by the English. Then, marching slowly, lest they should arrive too soon, they reached the river Gaspereau, which enters Mines Basin at Grand Pré. They were now but half a league from their destination. Here they stopped an hour in the storm, shivering and half frozen, waiting for nightfall. When it grew dark, they moved again, and soon came to a number of houses on the river bank. Each of the ten parties took possession of one of these, making great fires to warm themselves and dry their guns. It chanced that in the house where Coulon and his band sought shelter, a wedding feast was going on. The guests were much startled at this sudden eruption of armed men, but to the Canadians and their chief the festival was a stroke of amazing good luck for most of the guests were inhabitants of Grand Pré, who knew perfectly the houses occupied by the English, and could tell with precision where the officers were quartered. This was a point of extreme importance. The English were distributed among twenty-four houses, scattered, as before mentioned, for the distance of a mile and a half. The assailants were too few to attack all these houses at once, but if those where the chief officers lodged could be surprised and captured with their inmates, the rest could make little resistance. Hence it was that Coulon had divided his followers into ten parties, each with one or more chosen officers. These officers were now called together at the house of the interrupted festivity, and the late guests, having given full information as to the position of the English quarters and the military quality of their inmates, a special object of attack was assigned to the officer of each party, with Acadian guides to conduct him to it. The principal party, consisting of fifty, or, as another account says, of seventy-five men, was led by Coulon himself, with Beaujou, Delineris, Mercier, Lery, and Lusignan as his officers. 
This party was to attack a stone house near the middle of the village where the main guard was stationed, a building somewhat larger than the rest, and the only one at all suited for defence. The second party of forty men, commanded by La Corne, with Riganville, Lagny, and Villemont, was to attack a neighbouring house, the quarters of Colonel Noble, his brother Ensign Noble, and several other officers. The remaining parties of twenty-five men each, according to Beaujeu, or twenty-eight, according to La Corne, were to make a dash, as nearly as possible at the same time, at other houses which it was thought most important to secure. All had Acadian guides, whose services in that capacity were invaluable, though Beaujeu complains that they were of no use in the attack. He says that the united force was about three hundred men, while the English captain, Goldthwaite, puts it, including Acadians and Indians, at from five to six hundred. That of the English was a little above five hundred in all. Every arrangement being made, and his part assigned to each officer, the whole body was drawn up in the storm, and the chaplain pronounced a general absolution. Then each of the ten parties, guided by one or more Acadians, took the path for its destination, every man on snowshoes, with the lock of his gun well sheltered under his capote. End of section 41《Section 42 of a Half Century of Conflict. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Half Century of Conflict by Francis Parkman. Chapter 22, Part 3. The largest party under Coulon was, as we have seen, to attack the stone house in the middle of the village, but their guide went astray, and about three in the morning they approached a small wooden house not far from their true object. A guard was posted here, as at all the English quarters. The night was dark and the snow was still falling, as it had done without ceasing for the past thirty hours. The English sentinel descried through the darkness and the storm what seemed the shadows of an advancing crowd of men. He cried, Who goes there? and then shouted, To arms! A door was flung open, and the guard appeared in the entrance. But at that moment the moving shadows vanished from before the eyes of the sentinel. The French, one and all, had thrown themselves flat in the soft, light snow, and nothing was to be seen or heard. The English thought it a false alarm, and the house was quiet again. Then Coulon and his men rose and dashed forward. Again, in a loud and startled voice, the sentinel shouted, To arms! A great light, as of a blazing fire, shone through the open doorway, and men were seen within in hurried movement. Coulon, who was in the front, said to Beaujeu, who was close at his side, that the house was not the one they were to attack. Beaujeu replied that it was no time to change, and Coulon dashed forward again. Beaujeu aimed at the sentinel and shot him dead. There was the flash and report of muskets from the house, and Coulon dropped in the snow, severely wounded. The young cadet, Lusignan, was hit in the shoulder, but he still pushed on when a second shot shattered his thigh. Friends, cried the gallant youth as he fell by the side of his commander. Don't let two dead men discourage you. The Canadians, powdered from head to foot with snow, burst into the house. Within ten minutes, all resistance was overpowered. Of twenty-four Englishmen, 
twenty-one were killed and three made prisoners. Meanwhile, La Corne, with his party of forty men, had attacked the house where were quartered Colonel Noble and his brother, with Captain Howe and several other officers. Noble had lately transferred the main guard to the stone house, but had not yet removed thither himself and the guard in the house which he occupied was small. The French burst the door with axes and rushed in. Colonel Noble, startled from sleep, sprang from his bed, receiving two musket balls in the body as he did so. He seems to have had pistols, for he returned the fire several times. His servant, who was in the house, testified that the French called to the colonel through a window, and promised him quarter if he would surrender, but that he refused, on which they fired again, and a bullet, striking his forehead, killed him instantly. His brother, Ensign Noble, was also shot down, fighting in his shirt. Lieutenants Pickering and Lechmere lay in bed dangerously ill, and were killed there. Lieutenant Jones, after, as the narrator says, ridding himself of some of the enemy, tried to break through the rest and escape, but was run through the heart with a bayonet. Captain Howe was severely wounded and made prisoner. Coulon and Lusignan, disabled by their wounds, were carried back to the houses on the Gaspereau, where the French surgeon had remained. Coulon's party, now commanded by Beaujeu, having met and joined the smaller party under Lotbinière, proceeded to the aid of others who might need their help, for while they heard a great noise of musketry from far and near, and could discern bodies of men in motion here and there, they could not see whether these were friends or foes, or discern which side fortune favoured. They presently met the party of Marin, composed of twenty-five Indians who had just been repulsed with loss from the house which they had attacked. By this time there was a gleam of daylight, and as they plodded wearily over the snowdrifts, they no longer groped in darkness. The two parties of Colombier and Bouchebert soon joined them, with the agreeable news that each had captured a house and the united force now proceeded to make a successful attack on two buildings where the English had stored the frames of their blockhouses. Here the assailants captured ten prisoners. It was now broad day, but they could not see through the falling snow whether the enterprise as a whole had prospered or failed. Therefore Beaujeu sent Marin to find La Corne, who, in the absence of Coulon, held the chief command. Marin was gone two hours. At length he returned, and reported that the English in the houses which had not been attacked, together with such others as had not been killed or captured, had drawn together at the stone house in the middle of the village, and that La Corne was blockading them there and that he ordered Beaujeu and his party to join him at once. When Beaujeu reached the place, he found La Corne posted at the house where Noble had been killed, and which was within easy musket shot of the stone house occupied by the English, against whom a spattering fire was kept up by the French from the cover of neighboring buildings. Those in the stone house returned the fire, but no great harm was done on either side, till the English, now commanded by Captain Goldthwaite, attempted to recapture the house where La Corne and his party were posted. Two companies made a sally, but they had among them only eighteen pairs of snowshoes, the rest having been left on board the two vessels which had brought the stores of the detachment from Annapolis, and which now lay moored hard by, in the power of the enemy, at or near the mouth of the Gaspereau. 
hence the sallying party floundered helpless among the drifts plunging so deep in the dry snow that they could not use their guns and could scarcely move while bullets showered upon them from la corne's men in the house and others hovering about them on snowshoes the attempt was hopeless and after some loss the two companies fell back the firing continued as before till noon or according to beaujeu till three in the afternoon when a french officer carrying a flag of truce came out of la corne's house the occasion of the overture was this captain howe who as before mentioned had been badly wounded at the capture of this house was still there a prisoner without surgical aid the french surgeon being at the houses on the gaspereau in charge of coulon and other wounded men though says beaujeu monsieur howe was a firm man he begged the chevalier la corne not to let him bleed to death for want of aid but permit him to send for an english surgeon to this la corne after consulting with his officers consented and marin went to the english with a white flag and a note from howe explaining the situation the surgeon was sent and Howe's wound was dressed, Marin remaining as a hostage. A suspension of arms took place till the surgeon's return, after which it was prolonged till nine o'clock of the next morning, at the instance, according to French accounts of the English, and according to English accounts of the French. In either case, the truce was welcome to both sides the english who were in the stone house to the number of nearly three hundred and fifty crowded to suffocation had five small cannon two of which were four pounders and three were swivels but these were probably not in position as it does not appear that any use was made of them there was no ammunition except what the men had in their powder horns and bullet pouches the main stock having been left with other necessaries on board the schooner and sloop now in the hands of the french it was found on examination that they had ammunition for eight shots each and provisions for one day water was only to be had by bringing it from a neighboring brook as there were snowshoes for only about one man in twenty sorties were out of the question and the house was commanded by high ground on three sides though their number was still considerable their position was growing desperate thus it happened that when the truce expired goldthwaite the english commander with another officer who seems to have been captain preble came with a white flag to the house where la corne was posted and proposed terms of capitulation Hal, who spoke French, acting as interpreter. La Corne made proposals on his side, and as neither party was anxious to continue the fray, they soon came to an understanding. It was agreed that within forty-eight hours the English should march for Annapolis with the honors of war, that the prisoners taken by the French should remain in their hands, that the indians who had been the only plunderers should keep the plunder they had taken that the english sick and wounded should be left till their recovery at the neighboring settlement of riviere aux canards protected by a french guard and that the english engaged in the affair at grand pre should not bear arms during the next six months within the district about the head of the bay of fundy including chignecto grand pre and the neighboring settlements captain howe was released on parole with the condition that he should send back in exchange one la croix a french prisoner at boston which says la corne he faithfully did thus ended one of the most gallant exploits in french canadian annals as respects the losses on each side the french and english accounts are irreconcilable 
nor are the statements of either party consistent with themselves. Mascarene reports to Shirley that seventy English were killed, and above sixty captured, though he afterwards reduces these numbers, having, as he says, received farther information. On the French side, he says that four officers and about forty men were killed, and that many wounded were carried off in carts during the fight. Beaujou, on the other hand, sets the English loss at one hundred and thirty killed, fifteen wounded, and fifty captured, and the French loss at seven killed and fifteen wounded. As for the numbers engaged, the statements are scarcely less divergent. It seems clear, however, that when Coulon began his march from Bay Verte, his party consisted of about three hundred Canadians and Indians, without reckoning some Acadians who had joined him from Beaubassin and Isle St. John. Others joined him on the way to Grand Pré, counting a hundred and fifty according to Shirley, which appears to be much too large an estimate. The English, by their own showing, numbered five hundred or five hundred and twenty-five. Of eleven houses attacked, ten were surprised and carried with the help of the darkness and storm and the skilful management of the assailants. No sooner was the capitulation signed, says Beaujou, than we became in appearance the best of friends. La Corne directed military honors to be rendered to the remains of the brothers noble, and in all points the Canadians, both officers and men, treated the English with kindness and courtesy. The English commandant, says Beaujou, invited us all to dine with him and his officers, so that we might have the pleasure of making acquaintance over a bowl of punch. The repast being served after such a fashion as circumstances permitted, victors and vanquished sat down together, when, says Beaujou, we received on the part of our hosts many compliments on our polite manners and our skill in making war, and the compliments were well deserved. At eight o'clock on the morning of the 14th of February, the English filed out of the stone house and with arms shouldered, drums beating and colors flying, marched between two ranks of the French and took the road for Annapolis. The English sick and wounded were sent to the settlement of Riviere au Canard, where, protected by a French guard and attended by an English surgeon, they were to remain till able to reach the British fort. La Corne called a council of war, and in view of the scarcity of food and other reasons, it was resolved to return to Beaubassin. Many of the French had fallen ill. Some of the sick and wounded were left at Grand Pré, others at Cobequid, and the Acadians were required to supply means of carrying the rest. Coulon's party left Grand Pré on the 23rd of February, and on the 8th of March reached Beaubassin. Ramsay did not fail to use the success at Grand Pré to influence the minds of the Acadians. He sent a circular letter to the inhabitants of the various districts, and especially to those of mines, in which he told them that their country had been reconquered by the arms of the King of France, to whom he commanded them to be faithful subjects, holding no intercourse with the English under any pretense whatever, on pain of the severest punishment. If he concludes, we have withdrawn our soldiers from among you. It is for reasons known to us alone and with a view to your advantage. Unfortunately for the effect of this message, Shirley had no sooner heard of the disaster at Grand Pré than he sent a body of Massachusetts soldiers to reoccupy the place. This they did in April. The Acadians thus found themselves as usual between two dangers and unable to see which horn of the dilemma was the worse, 
they tried to avoid both by conciliating french and english alike and assuring each of their devoted attachment they sent a pathetic letter to ramsay telling him that their hearts were always french and begging him at the same time to remember that they were a poor helpless people burdened with large families and in danger of expulsion and ruin if they offended their masters the english they wrote at the same time to mascarene at annapolis sending him to explain the situation a copy of ramsay's threatening letter to them begging him to consider that they could not without danger dispense with answering it at the same time they protested their entire fidelity to king george ramsay not satisfied with the results of his first letter wrote again to the acadians ordering them in the name of the governor-general of new france to take up arms against the english and enclosing for their instruction an extract from a letter of the french governor these says ramsay are his words we consider ourselves as master of beaubassin and mines since we have driven off the english therefore there is no difficulty in forcing the acadians to take arms for us to which end we declare to them that they are discharged from the oath that they formerly took to the english by which they are bound no longer as has been decided by the authorities of canada and monseigneur our bishop in view of the above continues ramsay we order all the inhabitants of memeramcook to come to this place beaubassin as soon as they see the signal fires lighted or discover the approach of the enemy and this on pain of death confiscation of all their goods burning of their houses and the punishment due to rebels against the king the position of the acadians was deplorable by the treaty of utrecht france had transferred them to the british crown yet french officers denounced them as rebels and threatened them with death if they did not fight at their bidding against england and english officers threatened them with expulsion from the country if they broke their oath of allegiance to king george it was the duty of the british ministry to occupy the province with a force sufficient to protect the inhabitants against french terrorism and leave no doubt that the king of england was master of acadia in fact as well as in name this alone could have averted the danger of acadian revolt and the harsh measures to which it afterwards gave rise the ministry sent no aid but left to shirley and massachusetts the task of keeping the province for king george shirley and massachusetts did what they could but they could not do all that the emergency demanded shirley courageously spoke his mind to the ministry on whose favor he was dependent the fluctuating state of the inhabitants of acadia he wrote to newcastle seems my lord naturally to arise from their finding a want of due protection from his majesty's government end of section forty two section forty three of a half century of conflict this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Half Century of Conflict by Francis Parkman Chapter 23, Part 1, 1740-1747 War and Politics From the east we turn to the west, for the province of New York passed for the west at that day here a vital question was what would be the attitude of the five nations of the iroquois towards the rival european colonies their neighbors the treaty of utrecht called them british subjects what the word subjects meant they themselves hardly knew the english told them that it meant children 
the French that it meant dogs and slaves. Events had tamed the fierce confederates, and now, though like all savages unstable as children, they leaned in their soberer moments to a position of neutrality between their European neighbors, watching with jealous eyes against the encroachments of both. The French would gladly have enlisted them and their tomahawks in the war, but seeing little hope of this were generally content if they could prevent them from siding with the English, who on their part regarded them as their Indians and were satisfied with nothing less than active alliance. When Shirley's plan for the invasion of Canada was afoot, Clinton, governor of New York, with much ado, succeeded in convening the deputies of the Confederacy at Albany, and by dint of speeches and presents induced them to sing the war song and take up the hatchet for England. The Iroquois were disgusted when the scheme came to naught, their warlike ardor cooled, and they conceived a low opinion of English prowess. The condition of New York as respects military efficiency was deplorable. She was divided against herself, and, as usual in such cases, party passion was stronger than the demands of war. The province was in the midst of one of those disputes with the representative of the crown, which, in one degree or another, crippled or paralyzed the military activity of nearly all the British colonies, twenty years or more earlier when massachusetts was at blows with the indians on her borders she suffered from the same disorders but her government and assembly were of one mind as to urging on the war and quarrelled only on the questions in what way and under what command it should be waged but in new york there was a strong party that opposed the war being interested in the contraband trade long carried on with Canada. Clinton, the governor, had, too, an enemy in the person of the chief justice, James de Lancey, with whom he had had an after-dinner dispute, ending in a threat on the part of de Lancey that he would make the governor's seat uncomfortable. To marked abilities better education and more knowledge of the world than was often found in the provinces, ready wit and conspicuous social position, the chief justice joined a restless ambition and the arts of a demagogue. He made good his threat, headed the opposition to the governor, and proved his most formidable antagonist. If either Clinton or Shirley had had the independent authority of a Canadian governor, the conduct of the war would have been widely different. Clinton was hampered at every turn. The assembly held him at advantage, for it was they and not the king who paid his salary, and they could not withhold or retrench it when he displeased them. The people sympathized with their representatives and backed them in opposition, at least when not under the stress of imminent danger. A body of provincials in the pay of the king had been mustered at Albany for the proposed Canada expedition, and after that plan was abandoned, Clinton wished to use them for protecting the northern frontier and capturing that standing menace to the province Crown Point. The assembly, bent on crossing him at any price, refused to provide for transporting supplies farther than Albany, as the furnishing of provisions and transportation depended on that body. They could stop the movement of troops and defeat the governor's military plans at their pleasure. In vain he told them, if you deny me the necessary supplies, all my endeavors must become fruitless. I must wash my own hands and leave at your doors the blood of the innocent people. He urged upon them the necessity of building forts on the two carrying places between the Hudson and Lakes George and Champlain, 
thus blocking the path of war parties from Canada. They would do nothing, insisting that the neighboring colonies, to whom the forts would also be useful, ought to help in building them, and when it was found that these colonies were ready to do their part, the assembly still refused. Passionate opposition to the royal governor seemed to blind them to the interests of the province. Nor was the fault all on their side, for the governor, though he generally showed more self-control and moderation than could have been expected, sometimes lost temper and betrayed scorn for his opponents, many of whom were but the instruments of leaders urged by personal animosities and small but intense ambitions. They accused him of treating them with contempt and of embezzling public money, while he retorted by charging them with encroaching on the royal prerogative and treating the representative of the king with indecency. Under such conditions, an efficient conduct of the war was out of the question. Once, when the frontier was seriously threatened, Clinton, as commander-in-chief, called out the militia to defend it, but they refused to obey on the ground that no act of the assembly required them to do so. Clinton sent home bitter complaints to Newcastle and the Lords of Trade. They, the assembly, are selfish, jealous of the power of the crown, and of such levelling principles that they are constantly attacking its prerogative. I find that neither dissolutions nor fair means can produce from them such effects as will attend to a public good or their own preservation. They will neither act for themselves nor assist their neighbours. Few but hirelings have a seat in the assembly, who protract time for the sake of their wages at a great expense to the province without contributing anything material for its welfare, credit, or safety. And he declares that unless Parliament takes them in hand, he can do nothing for the service of the king or the good of the province, for they want to usurp the whole administration, both civil and military. At Saratoga there was a small settlement of Dutch farmers with a stockade fort for their protection. This was the farthest outpost of the colony, and the only defense of Albany in the direction of Canada. It was occupied by a sergeant, a corporal, and ten soldiers, who testified before a court of inquiry that it was in such condition that in rainy weather neither they nor their ammunition could be kept dry as neither the assembly nor the merchants of albany would make it tenable the garrison was withdrawn before winter by order of the governor scarcely was this done when five hundred french and indians under the partisan marin surprised the settlement in the night of the twenty eighth of november burned fort houses mills and stables killed thirty persons and carried off about a hundred prisoners. Albany was left uncovered, and the assembly voted one hundred and fifty pounds in provincial currency to rebuild the ruined fort. A feeble palisade work was accordingly set up, but it was neglected like its predecessor. Colonel Peter Schuyler was stationed there with his regiment in 1747, but was forced to abandon his post for want of supplies. Clinton then directed Colonel Roberts, commanding at Albany, to examine the fort, and if he found it indefensible, to burn it, which he did, much to the astonishment of a French war party, who visited the place soon after, and found nothing but ashes. The burning of Saratoga, first by the French, and then by its own masters, made a deep impression on the five nations, and a few years later they taunted their white neighbors with these shortcomings in no measured terms. You burned your own fort at Saratoga and ran away from it, which was a shame and a scandal to you. Uninitiated as they were in party politics and faction quarrels, 
they could see nothing in this and other military lapses but proof of a want of martial spirit, if not of cowardice. Hence the difficulty of gaining their active alliance against the French was redoubled. Fortunately for the province, the adverse influence was in some measure counteracted by the character and conduct of one man. Up to this time the French had far surpassed the rival nation in the possession of men ready and able to deal with the Indians and mould them to their will. Eminent among such was Jonquere, French emissary among the Senecas in western New York, who, with admirable skill, held back that powerful member of the Iroquois League from siding with the English. But now, among the Mohawks of eastern New York, John Kerr found his match in the person of William Johnson, a vigorous and intelligent young Irishman, nephew of Admiral Warren, and his agent in the management of his estates on the Mohawk. Johnson soon became intimate with his Indian neighbors, spoke their language, joined in their games and dances, sometimes borrowed their dress and their paint, and whooped, yelped, and stamped like one of themselves. A white man thus playing the Indian usually gains nothing in the esteem of those he imitates, but, as before in the case of the redoubtable Count Frontenac, Johnson's adoptions of their ways increased their liking for him and did not diminish their respect. The Mohawks adopted him into their tribe and made him a war chief. Clinton saw his value, and as the Albany commissioners hitherto charged with Indian affairs had proved wholly inefficient, he transferred their functions to Johnson, whence arose more heart-burnings. The favor of the governor cost the new functionary the support of the assembly, who refused the indispensable presence to the Indians, and thus vastly increased the difficulty of his task. Yet the five nations promised to take up the hatchet against the French, and their orator said in a conference at Albany, Should any French priests now dare to come among us, we know no use for them but to roast them. Johnson's present difficulties, however, sprang more from Dutch and English traders than from French priests, and he begs that an act may be passed against the selling of liquor to the Indians, as it is impossible to do anything with them while there is such a plenty to be had all around the neighborhood, being forever drunk. And he complains especially of one Clement, who sells liquor within twenty yards of Johnson's house, and immediately gets from the Indians all the bounty money they receive for scalps, which leaves them as poor as rats, and therefore refractory and unmanageable. Johnson says further, there is another grand villain, George Clock, who lives by Kona Johari Castle, and robs the Indians of all their clothes, etc., the chiefs complained, upon which I wrote him twice to give over that custom of selling liquor to the Indians. The answer was he gave the bearer, I might hang myself. Indian affairs, it will be seen, were no better regulated then than now. Meanwhile, the French Indians were ravaging the frontiers and burning farmhouses to within sight of Albany. The assembly offered rewards for the scalps of the marauders, but were slow in sending money to pay them, to the great discontent of the Mohawks, who, however, at Johnson's instigation, sent out various war parties, two of which, accompanied by a few whites, made raids as far as the island of Montreal, and somewhat checked the incursions of the Mission Indians by giving them work near home. The check was but momentary, Heathen Indians from the West joined the Canadian converts and the frontiers of New York and New England, from the Mohawk to beyond the Kennebec, were stung through all their length by innumerable nocturnal surprises 
and petty attacks. The details of this murderous though ineffective partisan war would fill volumes if they were worth recording. One or two examples will show the nature of all. In the valley of the little river Ashuelot, a New Hampshire affluent of the Connecticut, was a rude border settlement which later years transformed into a town noted in rural New England for kindly hospitality, culture without pretense, and good breeding without conventionality. In 1746, the place was in all the rawness and ugliness of a backwoods hamlet. The rough fields, lately won from the virgin forest, showed here and there among the stumps a few log cabins roofed with slabs of pine, spruce, or hemlock. Nearby was a wooden fort, made no doubt after the common frontier pattern of a stockade fence ten or twelve feet high, enclosing cabins to shelter the settlers in case of alarm, and furnished at the corners with what were called flankers, which were boxes of thick plank, large enough to hold two or more men, raised above the ground on posts, and pierced with loopholes so that each face of the stockade could be swept by a flank fire. One corner of this fort at Ashuelot was, however, guarded by a solid blockhouse, or, as it was commonly called, a mount. On the 23rd of April, a band of sixty, or by another account a hundred Indians, approached the settlement before daybreak, and hid in the neighboring thickets to cut off the men in the fort as they came out to their morning work. One of the men, Ephraim Dorman, chanced to go out earlier than the rest. The Indians did not fire on him, but not to give an alarm, tried to capture or kill him without noise. Several of them suddenly showed themselves, on which he threw down his gun in pretended submission. One of them came up to him with hatchet raised, but the nimble and sturdy borderer suddenly struck him with his fist a blow in the head that knocked him flat, then snatched up his own gun, and as some say the blanket of the half-stunned savage also, sprang off, reached the fort unhurt, and gave the alarm. Some of the families in this place were living in the fort, but the bolder or more careless still remained in their farmhouses, and if nothing were done for their relief, their fate was sealed. Therefore the men sallied forth in a body, and a sharp fight ensued, giving the frightened settlers time to take refuge within the stockade. It was not too soon, for the work of havoc had already begun. Six houses and a barn were on fire, and twenty-three cattle had been killed. The Indians fought fiercely, killed John Bullard, and captured Nathan Blake, but at last retreated, and after they were gone, the charred remains of several of them were found among the ruins of one of the burned cabins, where they had probably been thrown to prevent their being scalped. Before Dorman had given the alarm, an old woman, Mrs. McKenney, went from the fort to milk her cow in the neighboring barn. As she was returning with her full milk pail, a naked Indian was seen to spring from a clump of bushes, plunge a long knife into her back, and dart away without stopping to take the gray scalp of his victim. She tried feebly to reach the fort, but from age, corpulence, and a mortal wound, she moved but slowly, and when a few steps from the gate, fell and died. Ten days after, a party of Indians hid themselves at night by this same fort, and sent one of their number to gain admission under pretense of friendship, intending no doubt to rush in when the gate should be opened. But the man on guard detected the trick, and instead of opening the gate, fired through it, mortally wounding the Indian, on which his confederates made off. Again, at the same place, Deacon Josiah Foster, who had taken refuge in the fort, 
ventured out on a July morning to drive his cows to pasture. A gunshot was heard, and the men went out to learn the cause, found the deacon lying in the wood road, dead and scalped. An ambushed Indian had killed him and vanished. Such petty attacks were without number. There is a French paper called A Record of Military Movements which gives a list of war parties sent from Montreal against the English border between the 29th of March, 1746, and the 21st of June in the same year. They number 35 distinct bands, nearly all composed of Mission Indians living in or near the settled parts of Canada. Abenakis, Iroquois of the Lake of Two Mountains and of Salt St. Louis, Kahnawaga, Algonquins of the Ottawa, and others in parties rarely of more than thirty, and often of no more than six, yet enough for waylaying travellers or killing women in kitchens or cowsheds, and solitary labourers in the fields. This record is accompanied by a list of wild western Indians who came down to Montreal in the summer of 1746 to share in these military movements. End of section 43. Section 44 of A Half Century of Conflict. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Half Century of Conflict by Francis Parkman. Chapter 23, Part 2. No part of the country suffered more than the western borders of Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And here were seen too plainly the evils of the prevailing want of concert among the British colonies. Massachusetts claimed extensive tracts north of her present northern boundary, and in the belief that her claim would hold good, had built a small wooden fort called Fort Dummer, on the Connecticut, for the protection of settlers. New Hampshire disputed the title, and the question, being referred to the Crown, was decided in her favor. On this, Massachusetts withdrew the garrison of Fort Dummer and left New Hampshire to defend her own. This the assembly of that province refused to do, on the ground that the fort was fifty miles from any settlement made by New Hampshire people, and was therefore useless to them, though of great value to Massachusetts as a cover to Northfield and other of her settlements lower down the Connecticut. To protect, which was no business of New Hampshire. But some years before, in 1740, Three brothers, Samuel, David, and Stephen Farnsworth, natives of Groton, Massachusetts, had begun a new settlement on the Connecticut, about 45 miles north of the Massachusetts line, and on ground which was soon to be assigned to New Hampshire. They were followed by five or six others. They acted on the belief that their settlement was within the jurisdiction of Massachusetts, and that she could and would protect them. The place was one of extreme exposure, not only from its isolation far from help, but because it was on the banks of a wild and lonely river, the customary highway of war parties on their descent from Canada. Number four for so the new settlement was called, because it was the fourth in a range of townships recently marked out along the Connecticut, but with one or two exceptions, wholly unoccupied as yet, was a rude little outpost of civilization, buried in forests that spread unbroken to the banks of the St. Lawrence, while its nearest English neighbor was nearly thirty miles away, as may be supposed, it grew slowly, and in 1744 it had but nine or ten families. 
in the preceding year when war seemed imminent and it was clear that neither massachusetts nor new hampshire would lend a helping hand the settlers of number four seeing that their only resource was in themselves called a meeting to consider the situation and determine what should be done the meeting was held at the house or log cabin of john spafford jr and being duly called to order the following resolutions were adopted that a fort be built at the charge of the proprietors of the said township of number four that john hastings john spafford and john avery be a committee to direct the building that each carpenter be allowed nine shillings old tenor a day each laborer seven shillings and each pair of oxen three shillings and sixpence that the proprietors of the township be taxed in the sum of three hundred pounds old tenor for building the fort that john spafford phineas stevens and john hastings be assessors to assess the same and samuel farnsworth collector to collect it and to that end their fort should be a good and creditable one they are said to have engaged the services of john stoddart accounted the foremost man of western massachusetts superintendent of defense colonel of militia judge of probate chief justice of the court of common pleas a reputed authority in the construction of backwoods fortifications and the admired owner of the only gold watch in northampton timber was abundant and could be had for the asking for the frontiersman usually regarded a tree less as a valuable possession than as a natural enemy to be got rid of by fair means or foul the only cost was the labor the fort rose rapidly it was a square enclosing about three-quarters of an acre each side measuring a hundred and eighty feet the wall was not of palisades as was more usual but of squared logs laid one upon the other and interlocked at the corners after the fashion of a log cabin within were several houses which had been built close together for mutual protection before the fort was begun and which belonged to stevens spafford and other settlers apparently they were small log cabins for they were valued at only from eight to thirty-five pounds each in old tenor currency woefully attenuated by depreciation and these sums being paid to the owners out of the three hundred pounds collected for building the fort the cabins became public property either they were built in a straight line or they were moved to form one for when the fort was finished they all backed against the outer wall so that their low roofs served to fire from the usual flankers completed the work and the settlers of number four were so well pleased with it that they proudly declared their fort a better one than fort dummer its nearest neighbor which had been built by public authority at the charge of the province but a fort must have a garrison and the ten or twelve men of number four would hardly be a sufficient one sooner or later an attack was certain for the place was a backwoods castle dangerous lying in the path of war parties from canada whether coming down the connecticut from lake memphremagog or up otter creek from lake champlain then over the mountains to black river and so down that stream which would bring them directly to number four new hampshire would do nothing for them and their only hope was in massachusetts of which most of them were natives and which had good reasons for helping them to hold their ground as a cover to its own settlements below the governor of assembly of massachusetts did in fact 
send small parties of armed men from time to time to defend the endangered outpost and the succor was timely for though during the first year of the war number four was left in peace yet from the nineteenth of april to the nineteenth of june seventeen forty six it was attacked by indians five times with some loss of scalps and more of cattle horses and hogs on the last occasion there was a hot fight in the woods ending in the retreat of the indians said to have numbered a hundred and fifty into a swamp leaving behind them guns blankets hatchets spears and other things valued at forty pounds old tenor which says the chronicle was reckoned a great booty for such beggarly enemies but massachusetts grew tired of defending lands that had been adjudged to new hampshire and as the season drew towards an end number four was left again to its own keeping the settlers saw no choice but to abandon a place which they were too few to defend and accordingly withdrew to the older settlements after burying such of their effects as would bear it and leaving others to their fate six men a dog and a cat remained to keep the fort towards midwinter the human part of the garrison also withdrew and the two uncongenial quadrupeds were left alone when the authorities of massachusetts saw that a place so useful to them to bear the brunt of attack was left to certain destruction they repented of their late withdrawal and sent captain phineas stevens with thirty men to reoccupy it stevens a native of sudbury massachusetts one of the earliest settlers of number four and one of its chief proprietors was a bold intelligent and determined man well fitted for the work before him he and his band reached the fort on the twenty seventh of march seventeen forty seven and their arrival gave peculiar pleasure to its tenants the dog and cat the former of whom met them with lively demonstrations of joy. The pair had apparently lived in harmony and found means of subsistence, as they are reported to have been in tolerable condition. Stevens had brought with him a number of other dogs, animals found useful for detecting the presence of Indians and tracking them to their lurking places a week or more after the arrival of the party these canine allies showed great uneasiness and barked without seizing on which stevens ordered a strict watch to be kept and great precaution to be used in opening the gate of the fort it was time for the surrounding forest concealed what the new england chroniclers call an army commanded by general Debeline it scarcely need be said that canada had no general debeline and that no such name is to be found in canadian annals the army was a large war party of both french and indians and a french record shows that its commander was boucher de niverville ensign in the colony troops the behavior of the dogs was as yet the only sign of danger when about nine o'clock in the morning of the seventh of april one of stephen's men took it upon him to go out and find what was amiss accompanied by two or three of the dogs he advanced gun in hand into the clearing peering at every stump lest an indian should lurk behind it when about twenty rods from the gate he saw a large log or trunk of a fallen tree not far before him and approached it cautiously setting on the dogs or as stevens whimsically phrases it saying cho boy to them they ran forward barking on which several heads appeared above the log and several guns were fired at him he was slightly wounded but escaped to the fort then all around 
the air rang with war whoops and a storm of bullets flew from the tangle of bushes that edged the clearing and rapped spitefully but harmlessly against the wooden wall at a little distance on the windward side was a log house to which with adjacent fences the assailants presently set fire in the hope that as the wind was strong the flames would catch the fort when stephen saw what they were doing he set himself to thwart them and while some of his men kept them at bay with their guns the rest fell to work digging a number of short trenches under the wall on the side towards the fire as each trench was six or seven feet deep a man could stand in it outside the wall sheltered from bullets and dash buckets of water passed to him from within against the scorching timbers eleven such trenches were dug and eleven men were stationed in them so that the whole exposed front of the wall was kept wet thus though clouds of smoke drifted over the fort and burning cinders showered upon it no harm was done and the enemy was forced to other devices they found a wagon which they protected from water and bullets by a shield of planks for there was a sawmill hard by and loaded it with dry faggots thinking to set them on fire and push the blazing machine against a dry part of the fort wall but the task proved too dangerous for say stevens instead of performing what they threatened and seemed to be immediately going to undertake they called to us and desired a cessation of arms till sunrise the next morning which was granted at which time they said they would come to a parley in fact the french commander with about sixty of his men came in the morning with a flag of truce which he stuck in the ground at a musket shot from the fort and in the words of stevens said if we would send three men to him he would send as many to us stevens agreed to this on which two frenchmen and an indian came to the fort and three soldiers went out in return the two frenchmen demanded on the part of their commander that the garrison should surrender under a promise of life and be carried prisoners to quebec and they farther required that stevens should give his answer to the french officer in person wisely or unwisely stevens went out at the gate and was at once joined by neverville attended no doubt by an interpreter upon meeting the monsieur says the english captain he did not wait for me to give him an answer but said in a manner sufficiently peremptory that he had seven hundred men with him and that if his terms were refused he would storm the fort run over it burn it to the ground and if resistance were offered put all in it to the sword adding that he would have it or die and that stevens might fight or not as he pleased for it was all one to him his terms being refused he said as stevens reports well go back to your fort and see if your men dare fight any more and give me an answer quickly for my men want to be fighting stevens now acted as if he had been the moderator of a town meeting i went into the fort and called the men together and informed them what the general said and then put it to vote whether they would fight or resign and they voted to a man to stand it out and also declared that they would fight as long as they had life answer was made accordingly but neverville's promise to storm the fort and run over it was not kept stevens says that his enemies had not the courage to do this or even to bring up their fortification meaning their fire wagon with its shield of planks in fact an open assault upon a fortified place was a thing unknown in this border warfare whether waged by indians alone 
or by French and Indians together. The assailants only raised the war-whoop again and fired as before from behind stumps, logs, and bushes. This amusement they kept up from two o'clock till night, when they grew bolder, approached nearer, and shot flights of fire-arrows into the fort, which, water being abundant, were as harmless as their bullets. At daylight they gave over this exercise, called out good morning to the garrison, and asked for a suspension of arms for two hours. This being agreed to, another flag of truce presently appeared, carried by two Indians, who planted it in the ground within a stone's throw of the fort, and asked that two men should be sent out to confer with them. This was done, and the men soon came back with the proposal that Stevens should sell provisions to his besiegers, under a promise on their part that they would give him no farther trouble. He answered that he would not sell them provisions for money, but would exchange them for prisoners, and gave five bushels of Indian corn for every hostage placed in his hands as security for the release of an English captive in Canada. To this their only answer was firing a few shots against the fort, after which they all disappeared and were seen no more. The garrison had scarcely eaten or slept for three days. I believe men were never known to hold out with better resolution, writes Stevens, and though there were some thousands of guns shot at us, we had but two men slightly wounded, John Brown and Joseph Ely. Neverville and his party, disappointed and hungry, now made a tour among the scattered farms and hamlets of the country below, which, incapable of resisting such an inroad, were abandoned at their approach. Thus they took an easy revenge for their rebuff at number four, and in a march of thirty or forty leagues burned five small deserted forts or stockaded houses, three meeting houses, several fine barns, about one hundred dwellings mostly of two stories, furnished even to chest of drawers, and killed five to six hundred sheep and hogs, and about thirty horned cattle. This devastation is well worth a few prisoners or scalps. It is curious to find such exploits mentioned with complacency as evidence of prowess. The successful defense of the most exposed place on the frontier was welcome news throughout New England, and Commodore Charles Knowles, who was then at Boston, sent Stevens a silver-hilted sword in recognition of his conduct. The settlers of number four, who soon returned to their backwoods home, were so well pleased with this compliment to one of their fellows, that they gave to the settlement the baptismal name of the Commodore, and the town that has succeeded the hamlet of number four is Charlestown to this day. End of section 44. Section 45 of A Half Century of Conflict. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Half Century of Conflict by Francis Parkman. Chapter 24, Part 1, 1745 to 1748. Fort, Massachusetts. Since the last war, the settlements of Massachusetts had pushed westward and begun to invade the beautiful region of mountains and valleys that now forms Berkshire. Villages, or rudiments of villages, had grown up on the Housatonic, and an establishment had been attempted at Pontusac, now Pittsfield, on the extreme western limits of the province. The position of these new settlements was critical, for the enemy could reach them with little difficulty by way of Lake Champlain and Wood Creek. 
the Massachusetts government was not unmindful of them, and when war again broke out, three wooden forts were built for their protection, forming a line of defense westward from Northfield on the northern frontier of the province. One of these forts was in the present town of Heath, and was called Fort Shirley. Another, named Fort Pelham, was in the present town of Rowe, while the third, Fort Massachusetts, was farther westward in what is now the town of Adams, then known as East Hoosac. Two hundred men from the militia were taken into pay to hold these posts and patrol the intervening forests. Other defensive works were made here and there, sometimes by the votes of town meetings, and sometimes by individuals at their own cost. These works consisted of a fence of palisades enclosing a farmhouse, or sometimes a blockhouse of timber or heavy planks. Thus, at Northfield, Deacon Ebenezer Alexander, a veteran of sixty who had served at Louisbourg, built a mount or blockhouse on the knoll behind his house, and carried a stockade from it to enclose the dwelling, shed, and barn, the whole at the cost of thirty-six pounds, one shilling and sixpence, in Massachusetts currency, which the town repaid him, his fortifications being of public utility as a place of refuge for families in case of attack. Northfield was a place notoriously dangerous, and military methods were in vogue there in season and out of season. Thus, by a vote of the town, the people were called to the Sunday sermon by beat of drum, and Eliezer Holton was elected to sound the call in consideration of one pound and ten shillings a year, the drum being hired of Ensign Field, its fortunate possessor, for the farther sum of three shillings. This was in the earlier days of Northfield. In 1734, the Sunday drumbeat was stopped, and the worshippers were summoned by the less obstreperous method of hanging out a flag for the faithful discharge of which function Daniel Wright received in 1744 one pound and five shillings. The various fortifications, public and private, were garrisoned, sometimes by the owner and his neighbors, sometimes by men in pay of the provincial assembly as was to be expected from a legislative body undertaking warlike operations, the work of defence was but indifferently conducted. John Stoddart, the village magnate of Northampton, was charged, among the rest of his multifarious employments, with the locating and construction of forts. Captain Ephraim Williams was assigned to the general command on the western frontier, with headquarters at Fort Shirley and afterwards at Fort Massachusetts, and Major Israel Williams of Hatfield was made commissary. At Northfield dwelt the Reverend Benjamin Doolittle, minister, apothecary, physician, and surgeon of the village, for he had studied medicine no less than theology. His parishioners thought that his cure of bodies encroached on his cure of souls, and requested him to confine his attention to his spiritual charge, to which he replied that he could not afford it, his salary as minister being seventy-five pounds in irredeemable Massachusetts paper, while his medical and surgical practice brought him full four hundred a year. He offered to comply with the wishes of his flock if they would add that amount to his salary, which they were not prepared to do, and the minister continued his heterogeneous labors as before. As the position of his house on the village street seems to have been regarded as strategic, the town voted to fortify it with a blockhouse and a stockade. 
for the benefit both of the occupant and of all the villagers. This was accordingly done at the cost of eighteen pounds, seven shillings and sixpence for the blockhouse, and a further charge for the stockade, and thenceforth Mr. Doolittle could write his sermons and mix his doses in peace. To his other callings he added that of historiographer, when, after a ministry of thirty-six years, the thrifty pastor was busied one day with hammer and nails in mending the fence of his yard, he suddenly dropped dead from a stroke of heart disease, to the grief of all Northfield, and his papers being searched, a record was found in his handwritings of the inroads of the enemy that had happened in his time on or near the Massachusetts border. Being rightly thought worthy of publication, it was printed at Boston in a dingy pamphlet, now extremely rare and much prized by antiquarians. Appended to it are the remarks of the author on the conduct of the war. He complains that plans are changed so often that none of them take effect that terms of enlistment are so short that the commissary can hardly serve out provisions to the men before their time is expired, that neither bread, meat, shoes, nor blankets are kept on hand for an emergency, so that the enemy escape while the soldiers are getting ready to pursue them, that the pay of a drafted man is so small that twice as much would not hire a laborer to take care of his farm in his absence, and that untried and unfit persons are commissioned as officers, in all of which strictures there is no doubt much truth. Mr. Doolittle's rueful narrative treats many of miscellaneous murders and scalpings, interesting only to the sufferers and their friends, but he also chronicles briefly a formidable inroad that still holds a place in New England history. It may be remembered that Shirley had devised a plan for capturing Fort Frederick, or Crown Point, built by the French at the narrows of Lake Champlain, and commanding ready access for war parties to New York and New England. The approach of Donville's fleet had defeated the plan, but rumors of it had reached Canada and excited great alarm. Large bodies of men were ordered to Lake Champlain to protect the threatened fort. The two brothers de Moy were already on the lake with a numerous party of Canadians and Indians, both Christian and heathen, and Rigaud de Vaudreuil, town mayor of Three Rivers, was ordered to follow with a still larger force, repel any English attack, or, if none should be made, take the offensive and strike a blow at the English frontier. On the 3rd of August, Rigaud, left Montreal with a fleet of canoes carrying what he calls his army, and on the twelfth he encamped on the east side of the lake, at the mouth of Otter Creek. There was rain, thunder, and a violent wind all night, but the storm ceased at daybreak, and embarking again, they soon saw the octagonal stone tower of Fort Frederick. The party set up their tents and wigwams near the fort, and on the morning of the 16th the elder de Moy arrived with a reinforcement of sixty Frenchmen and a band of Indians. They had just returned from an incursion towards Albany, and reported that all was quiet in those parts, and that Fort Frederick was in no danger. Now, to their great satisfaction, Rigaud and his band saw themselves free to take the offensive. The question was where to strike. The Indians held council after council, made speech after speech, and agreed on nothing. Rigaud gave them a wampum belt and told them that he meant to attack Corlaire, 
that is, Schenectady, at which they seemed well pleased and sang war songs all night. In the morning they changed their minds, and begged him to call the whole army to a council for debating the question. It appeared that some of them, especially the Iroquois, converts of Kahnawaga, disapproved of attacking Schenectady, because some of their Mohawk relatives were always making visits there, and might be inadvertently killed by the wild western Indians of Rigaud's party. Now all was doubt again, for, as Indians are unstable as water, it was no easy task to hold them to any plan of action. The Abenakis proposed a solution of the difficulty. They knew the New England border well, for many of them had lived upon it before the war, on terms of friendly intercourse with the settlers. They now drew upon the floor of the council room a rough map of the country, on which was seen a certain river, and on its upper waters a fort which they recommended as a proper object of attack. The river was that eastern tributary of the Hudson which the French called the Kaskikuki, the Dutch the Skiatikuk, and the English the Hoosac. The fort was Fort Massachusetts, the most westerly of the three posts lately built to guard the frontier. My father, said the Abenaki spokesman to Rigaud, it will be easy to take this fort and make great havoc on the lands of the English. Deign to listen to your children and follow our advice. One Cadenaret, an Abenaki chief, had been killed near Fort Massachusetts in the late spring, and his tribesmen were keen to revenge him. Seeing his Indians pleased with the proposal to march for the Hoosac, Rigaud gladly accepted it, on which whoops, yelps, and war songs filled the air. Hardly, however, was the party on its way when the Indians changed their minds again and wanted to attack Saratoga, but Rigaud told them that they had made their choice and must abide by it, to which they assented and gave him no farther trouble. On the 20th of August they all embarked and paddled southward, past the lowly promontory where Fort Ticonderoga was afterwards built, and held their course till the lake dwindled to a mere canal creeping through the weedy marsh, then called the Drowned Lands. Here, nine summers later, passed the flotilla of Baron Dieskau, bound to defeat and ruin by the shores of Lake George. Rigaud stopped at a place known as East Bay at the mouth of a stream that joins Wood Creek, just north of the present town of Whitehall. Here he left the younger Des Moines with thirty men to guard the canoes. The rest of the party, guided by a brother of the slain Cadenaret, filed southward on foot along the base of Skeen Mountain that overlooks Whitehall. They counted about seven hundred men, of whom five hundred were French, and a little above two hundred were Indians. Some other French reports put the whole number at eleven hundred, or even twelve hundred, while several English accounts make it eight hundred or nine hundred. The Frenchmen of the party included both regulars and Canadians, with six regular officers and ten cadets, eighteen militia officers, two chaplains, one for the whites and one for the Indians, and a surgeon. After a march of four days, they encamped on the 26th by a stream which ran into the Hudson, and was no doubt the Baton Kill known to the French as La Riviere de Saratoga. Being nearly opposite Saratoga, where there was then a garrison, they changed their course on the 27th from south to southeast, the better to avoid scouting parties, which might discover their trail and defeat their plan of surprise. Early on the next day they reached the Hoosac, 
far above its mouth, and now their march was easier. For, says Rigaud, we got out of the woods and followed a large road that led up the river. In fact, there seemed to have been two roads, one on each side of the Hoosac, for the French were formed into two brigades, one of which, under the Sieur de la Valterie, filed along the right bank of the stream, and the other, under the Sieur de Sabrevois, along the left, while the Indians marched on the front flanks and rear. They passed deserted houses and farms belonging to Dutch settlers from the Hudson, for the Hoosac, in this part of its course, was in the province of New York. They did not stop to burn barns and houses, but they killed poultry, hogs, a cow, and a horse, to supply themselves with meat. Before night they had passed the New York line, and they made their camp in or near the valley where Williamstown and William College now stand. Here they were joined by the Sieurs Beaubassin à La Force, who had gone forward with eight Indians to reconnoitre. Beaubassin had watched Fort Massachusetts from a distance, and had seen a man go up into the watchtower, but could discover no other sign of alarm. Apparently the fugitive Dutch farmers had not taken pains to warn the English garrison of the coming danger, for there was a coolness between the neighbors. Before breaking up camp in the morning, Rigaud called the Indian chiefs together and said to them, My children, the time is near when we must get other meat than fresh pork, and we will all eat it together. Meat, in Indian parlance, means prisoners, and as these were valuable by reason of the ransoms paid for them, and as the Indians had suspected that the French meant to keep them all, they were well pleased with this figurative assistance of Rigaud that they should have their share. The chaplain said mass, and the party marched in a brisk rain up the Williamstown Valley, till after advancing about ten miles they encamped again. Fort Massachusetts was only three or four miles distant. Rigaud held a talk with the Abenaki chiefs who had acted as guides, and it was agreed that the party should stop in the woods near the fort, make scaling ladders, battering rams to burst the gates, and other things needful for a grand assault to take place before daylight, but their plan came to naught through the impetuosity of the young Indians and Canadians, who were so excited at the first glimpse of the watchtower of the fort, that they dashed forward, as Rigaud says, like lions. Hence one might fairly expect to see the fort assaulted at once, but by the maxims of forest war, this would have been reprehensible rashness, and nothing of the kind was attempted. The assailants spread to right and left, squatted behind stumps, and opened a distant and harmless fire, accompanied with unearthly yells and howlings. Fort Massachusetts was a wooden enclosure formed like the fort at number four, of beams laid one upon another, and interlocked at the angles. This wooden wall seems to have rested not immediately upon the ground, but upon a foundation of stone, designed by Mr. Norton, the chaplain, as the underpinning, a name usually given in New England to foundations of the kind. At the northwest corner was a blockhouse, crowned with the watchtower, the sight of which had prematurely kindled the martial fire of the Canadians and Indians. This wooden structure at the apex of the blockhouse served as a lookout, and also supplied means of throwing water to extinguish fire arrows shot upon the roof. There were other buildings in the enclosure, especially a large log house on the south side, 
which seems to have overlooked the outer wall, and was no doubt loopholed for musketry. On the east side there was a well, furnished probably with one of those long well sweeps universal in primitive New England. The garrison, when complete, consisted of fifty-one men under Captain Ephraim Williams, who has left his name to Williamstown and Williams College, of the latter of which he was the founder. He was born at Newton, near Boston, was a man vigorous in body and mind, better acquainted with the world than most of his countrymen, having followed the seas in his youth, and visited England, Spain, and Holland. Frank and agreeable in manners, well fitted for such a command, and respected and loved by his men. When the proposed invasion of Canada was preparing, he and some of his men went to take part in it, and had not yet returned. The fort was left in charge of a sergeant, John Hawkes of Deerfield, with men too few for the extent of the works, and a supply of ammunition nearly exhausted. Canada being put then on the defensive, the frontier forts were thought safe for a time. On the Saturday before Rigaud's arrival, Hawkes had sent Thomas Williams, the surgeon, brother of the absent captain, to Deerfield, with a detachment of fourteen men, to get a supply of powder and lead. This detachment reduced the entire force, including Hawkes himself and Norton the chaplain, to twenty-two men, half of whom were disabled with dysentery, from which few of the rest were wholly free. There were also in the fort three women and five children. The site of Fort Massachusetts is now a meadow by the banks of the Hoosac. Then it was a rough clearing, encumbered with the stumps and refuse of the primeval forest, whose living hosts stood grimly around it, and spread, untouched by the axe, up the sides of the neighboring Saddleback Mountain. The position of the fort was bad, being commanded by high ground, from which, as the chaplain tells us, the enemy could shoot over the north side into the middle of the parade, for which serious defect John Stoddart of Northampton, legist, capitalist, colonel of militia, and superintendent of defense, was probably answerable. These frontier forts were, however, often placed on low ground with a view to an abundant supply of water fire being the most dreaded enemy in Indian warfare. End of section 45 Section 46 of A Half Century of Conflict This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org A Half Century of Conflict by Francis Parkman. Chapter 24, Part 2. Sergeant Hawkes, the provisional commander, was, according to tradition, a tall man with sunburnt features, erect, spare, very sinewy and strong, and of a bold and resolute temper. He had need to be so, for counting every man in the fort, lay and clerical, sick and well. He was beset by more than thirty times his own number, or counting only his effective men, by more than sixty times, and this at the lowest report of the attacking force. As there was nothing but a log fence between him and his enemy, it was clear that they could hew or burn a way through it, or climb over it with no surprising effort of valor. Rigaud, as we have seen, had planned a general assault under cover of night, but had been thwarted by the precipitancy of the young Indians and Canadians. 
these now showed no inclination to depart from the cautious maxims of forest warfare they made a terrific noise but when they came within gunshot of the fort it was by darting from stump to stump with a quick zigzag movement that made them more difficult to hit than birds on the wing the best moment for a shot was when they reached a stump and stopped for an instant to duck and hide behind it by seizing this fleeting opportunity hawks himself put a bullet into the breast of an abenaki chief from st francis which ended his days says the chaplain in view of the nimbleness of the assailants a charge of buckshot was found more to the purpose than a bullet besides the slain abenaki rigaud reports sixteen indians and frenchmen wounded which under the circumstances was good execution for ten farmers and a minister for chaplain norton loaded and fired with the rest rigaud himself was one of the wounded having been hit in the arm and sent to the rear as he stood giving orders on the rocky hill about forty rods from the fort probably it was a chance shot since though rifles were invented long before they were not yet in general use and the yeoman garrison were armed with nothing but their own smooth bore hunting pieces not to be trusted at long range the supply of ammunition had sunk so low that hawks was forced to give the discouraging order not to fire except when necessary to keep the enemy in check or when the chance of hitting him should be unusually good such of the sick men as were strong enough aided the defence by casting bullets and buckshot the outrageous noise lasted till towards nine in the evening when the assailants greeted the fort with a general war-whoop and repeated it three or four times then a line of sentinels was placed around it to prevent messengers from carrying the alarm to albany or deerfield the evening was dark and cloudy the lights of a camp could be seen by the river towards the southeast and those of another near the swamp towards the west there was a sound of axes as if the enemy were making scaling ladders for a night assault but it was found that they were cutting faggots to burn the wall hawks ordered every tub and bucket to be filled with water in preparation for the crisis two men john aldrich and jonathan bridgman had been wounded thus farther reducing the strength of the defenders the chaplain says of those that were in health some were ordered to keep the watch and some lay down and endeavored to get some rest lying down in our clothes with our arms by us we got little or no rest the enemy frequently raised us by their hideous outcries as though they were about to attack us the latter part of the night i kept the watch rigaud spent the night in preparing for a decisive attack being resolved to open trenches two hours before sunrise and push them to the foot of the palisade so as to place faggots against it set them on fire to deliver the fort a prey to the fury of the flames it began to rain and he determined to wait till morning that the commander of seven hundred french and indians should resort to such elaborate devices to subdue a sergeant seven militiamen and a minister for this was now the effective strength of the besieged was no small compliment to the spirit of the defence the firing was renewed in the morning but there was no attempt to open trenches by daylight two men were sent up into the watch-tower and about eleven o'clock one of them thomas knowlton was shot through the head the number of effectives was thus reduced to eight including the chaplain up to this time the french and english witnesses are in tolerable accord but now there is evidence of conflict 
Rigaud says that when he was about to carry his plan of attack into execution, he saw a white flag hung out, and sent the elder de Moy, with Montigny and Dortoy, to hear what the English commandant, whose humble rank he nowhere mentions, had to say. On the other hand, Norton, the chaplain, says about noon the French desired to parley, and that we agreed to it. He says farther that the sergeant, with himself and one or two others, met Rigaud outside the gate, and that the French commander promised good quarter to the besieged if they would surrender, with the alternative of an assault if they would not. This account is sustained by Hawkes, who says that at twelve o'clock an Indian came forward with a flag of truce, and that he, Hawkes, with two or three others, went to meet Rigaud, who then offered honorable terms of capitulation. The sergeant promised an answer within two hours, and going back to the fort with his companions, examined their means of defense. He found that they had left but three or four pounds of gunpowder, and about as much lead. Hawkes called a council of his effective men. Norton prayed for divine aid and guidance, and they then fell to considering the situation. Had we all been in health, or had there been only those eight of us that were in health, I believe every man would willingly have stood it out to the last. For my part, I should, writes the manful chaplain, but besides the sick and wounded, there were three women and five children, who, if the fort were taken by assault, would no doubt be butchered by the Indians, but who might be saved by a capitulation. Hawkes therefore resolved to make the best terms he could. He had defended his post against prodigious odds for twenty-eight hours. Rigaud promised that all in the fort should be treated with humanity as prisoners of war, and exchanged at the first opportunity. He also promised that none of them should be given to the Indians, though he had lately assured his savage allies that they should have their share of the prisoners. At three o'clock, the principal French officers were admitted into the fort, and the French flag was raised over it. The Indians and Canadians were excluded, on which some of the Indians pulled out several of the stones that formed the foundation of the wall, crawled through, opened the gate, and let in the whole crew. They raised a yell when they saw the blood of Thomas Knowlton trickling from the watchtower where he had been shot, then rushed up to where the corpse lay, brought it down, scalped it, and cut off the head and arms. The fort was then plundered, set on fire, and burned to the ground. The prisoners were led to the French camp, and here the chaplain was presently accosted by one Doty, Rigaud's interpreter, who begged him to persuade some of the prisoners to go with the Indians. Norton replied that it had been agreed that they should all remain with the French, and that to give up any of them to the Indians would be a breach of the capitulation. Doty then appealed to the men themselves, who all insisted on being left with the French, according to the terms stipulated. Some of them, however, were given to the Indians, who, after Rigaud's promise to them, could have been pacified in no other way. His fault was in making a stipulation that he could not keep. Hawkes and Norton, with all the women and children, remained in the French camp. Hearing that men were expected from Deerfield to take the places of the sick, Rigaud sent sixty Indians to cut them off. They lay in wait for the English reinforcement, which consisted of nineteen men, gave them a close fire, shot down fifteen of them, and captured the rest. 
this or another party of Rigaud's Indians pushed as far as Deerfield and tried to waylay the farmers as they went to their work on a Monday morning. The Indians hid in a growth of alder bushes along the edge of a meadow where men were making hay, accompanied by some children. One Ebenezer Hawks, shooting partridges, came so near the ambushed warriors that they could not resist the temptation of killing and scalping him. This alarmed the haymakers and the children, who ran for their lives towards a mill on a brook that entered Deerfield River fiercely pursued by about fifty Indians, who caught and scalped a boy named Amsden. Three men, Allen, Sadler, and Gillett, got under the bank of the river and fired on the pursuers. Allen and Gillett were soon killed, but Sadler escaped unhurt to an island. Three children of Allen, Eunice, Samuel, and Caleb, were also chased by the Indians, who knocked down Eunice with a tomahawk, but were in too much haste to stop and scalp her, and she lived to a good old age. Her brother Samuel was caught and dragged off, but Caleb ran into a field of tall maize and escaped. The firing was heard in the village, and a few armed men under Lieutenant Clesson hastened to the rescue, but when they reached the spot, the Indians were gone, carrying the boy Samuel Allen with them, and leaving two of their own number dead. Clesson, with such men as he had, followed their trail up Deerfield River, but could not overtake the light-footed savages. Meanwhile, the prisoners at Fort Massachusetts spent the first night well guarded in the French and Indian camps. In the morning, Norton, accompanied by a Frenchman and several Indians, was permitted to nail to one of the charred posts of the fort a note to tell what happened to him and his companions. The victors then marched back as they had come along the Hoosac Road. They moved slowly, unencumbered as they were by the sick and wounded. Rigaud gave the Indians presents to induce them to treat their prisoners with humanity. Norton was in charge of de Moy, and after walking four miles, sat down with him to rest in Williamstown Valley. There was a yell from the Indians in the rear. I trembled, writes Norton, thinking they had murdered some of our people but was filled with admiration when I saw all our prisoners come up with us, and John Aldrich carried on the back of his Indian master. Aldrich had been shot in the foot and could not walk. We set out again and had gone but a little way before we came up with Josiah Reed. Reed was extremely ill and could go no further. Norton thought that the Indians would kill him, instead of which one of them carried him on his back. They were said to have killed him soon after, but there is good reason to think that he died of disease. I saw John Perry's wife, pursues the chaplain. She complained that she was almost ready to give out. The Indians threatened her, but Hawks spoke in her behalf to Rigaud, who remonstrated with them, and they afterwards treated her well. The wife of another soldier, John Smead, was near her time, and had lingered behind. The French showed her great kindness. Some of them made a seat for her to sit upon, and brought her to the camp, where about ten o'clock she was graciously delivered of a daughter, and was remarkably well. Friday, this morning, I baptized John Smead's child. He called its name Captivity. The French made a litter of poles, spread it over a deer skin and a bear skin, on which they placed the mother and child, and so carried them forward. Three days later there was a heavy rain, and the mother was completely drenched, but suffered no harm though Miriam, the wife of Moses Scott, 
hereby catched a grievous cold. John Perry was relieved of his pack so that he might help his wife and carry her when her strength failed. Several horses were found at the farms along the way, and the sick Benjamin Simons and the wounded John Aldrich were allowed to use two of them. Rarely, indeed, in these dismal border raids were prisoners treated so humanely, and the credit seems chiefly due to the efforts of Rigaud and his officers. The hardships of the march were shared by the victors, some of whom were sorely wounded, and four Indians died within a few days. I divided my army between the two sides of the Kaskikuki, Huzak, says Rigaud, and ordered them to do what I had not permitted to be done before we reached Fort Massachusetts. Every house was set on fire, and numbers of domestic animals of all sorts were killed. French and Indians vied with each other in pillage, and I made them enter the valleys of all the little streams that flow into the Kaskakuki and lay waste everything there. Wherever we went, we made the same havoc, laid waste both sides of the river through twelve leagues of fertile country, burned houses, barns, stable, and even a meeting-house, in all above two hundred establishments, killed all the cattle and ruined all the crops. Such, Monseigneur, was the damage I did our enemies during the eight or nine days I was in their country. As the Dutch settlers had escaped, there was no resistance. The French and their allies left the Hoosac at the point where they had reached it, and retraced their steps northward through the forest where there was an old Indian trail. Recrossing the Batten Kill, or River of Saratoga, and some branches of Wood Creek, they reached the place where they had left their canoes and found them safe. Rigaud says, I gave leave to the Indians at their request to continue their fighting and ravaging in small parties towards Albany, Schenectady, Deerfield, Saratoga, or wherever they pleased, and I even gave them a few officers and cadets to lead them. These small ventures were more or less successful, and produced, in good time, a good return of scalps. The main body, now afloat again, sailed and paddled northward till they reached Crown Point. Rigaud rejoiced at finding a haven of refuge, for his wounded arm was greatly inflamed, and it was time I should reach a place of repose. He and his men encamped by the fort and remained there for some time. An epidemic, apparently like that at Fort Massachusetts, had broken out among them, and great numbers were seriously ill. Norton was lodged in a French house on the east side of the lake, at what is now called Chimney Point, and one day his guardian, de Moy, either thinking to impress him with the strength of the place, or with an amusing confidence in the minister's incapacity for making inconvenient military observations, invited him to visit the fort. He accepted the invitation, crossed over with the courteous officer, and reports the ramparts to have been twenty feet thick, about twenty feet high, and mounted with above twenty cannon. The octagonal tower which overlooked the ramparts and answered in some sort to the donjon of a feudal castle, was a bomb-proof structure in vaulted masonry of the slaty black limestone of the neighborhood, three stories in height, and armed with nine or ten cannon, besides a great number of patereros, a kind of pivot gun much like a swivel. In due time the prisoners reached Montreal, whence they were sent to Quebec and in the course of the next year those who remained alive were exchanged and returned to New England. Mrs. Smead and her infant daughter, Captivity, died in Canada 
and by a singular fatality her husband had scarcely returned home when he was waylaid and killed by indians fort massachusetts was soon rebuilt by the province and held its own thenceforth till the war was over sergeant hawkes became a lieutenant colonel and took a creditable part in the last french war for two years after the incursion of rigaud the new england borders were scourged with partisan warfare bloody monotonous and futile with no event that needs recording and no result beyond a momentary check to the progress of settlement at length in july seventeen forty eight news came that the chief contending powers in europe had come to terms of agreement and in the next october the peace of aix la chapelle was signed both nations were tired of the weary and barren conflict with its enormous cost and its vast entail of debt it was agreed that conquests should be mutually restored the chief conquest of england was louisbourg with the island of cape breton won for her by the farmers and fishermen of new england when the preliminaries of peace were under discussion louis the fifteenth had demanded the restitution of the lost fortress and george the second is said to have replied that it was not his to give having been captured by the people of boston but his sense of justice was forced to yield to diplomatic necessity for louisbourg was the indispensable price of peace to the indignation of the northern provinces it was restored to its former owners the british ministers says smollett gave up the important island of cape breton in exchange for a petty factory in the east indies madras and the king deigned to send two english noblemen to the french court as security for the bargain peace returned to the tormented borders the settlements advanced again and the colonists found a short breathing space against the great conclusive struggle of the seven years war end of section forty six end of half a century of conflict by francis parkman jr